Hello and welcome to Dialogue. I'm Yang Ren in Beijing. Plans for a new Silk Road for the 21st century are being promoted by Chinese President Xi Jinping. He envisages an economic belt along the route of the ongoing Silk Road traversed more than 2,000 years ago. The proposal has attracted widespread support as a means of boosting trade and cooperation across the two continents. One of the uh, keenest supporters is the international think tank, the Schiller Institute, led by its president, Ms. Helga zeppler Huj, who is first advocated the idea of a Eurasian land bridge more than 20 years ago. She joins us now in the Beijing studio to discuss the importance of a modern Silk Road. What differences will it make to Central Asia? And will Eurasia emerge as a new economic power? And what impact would it have on China and the Asia-Pacific region? Before we start our interview, let's look at this background report. Camel caravans traversing the vast landmass of Eurasia. Chinese tradesmen ventured out from as early as the Han Dynasty more than 2,000 years ago. From Xi'an, the heart of the Central Plains, they traveled to India, Iran, and as far as Europe, laden with goods. The rich cultural legacy is found in both written records and artifacts. Not only did goods travel along the long-distance routes, so do technologies, religions, and philosophies. Cultural transfer took place as the Chinese learned from other societies, especially India, the home of Buddhism. And the travelers brought their cultures to distant lands. Thriving in their new homes, newcomers mixed with locals and often absorbed other groups that followed. Exchanges between China and the West facilitated the spread of technologies and ideas. The impact is far-reaching. It's essential that countries learn from each other to contribute to the harmony and development of the world. Professor Wang believes the Silk Road has a practical significance. The ancient roots stood witness to the exchange and merging of different cultures. It once again underlines the importance of cooperation and tolerance values that were needed in a closely intertwined world. The Silk Road has facilitated exchange of goods, people and technology. It's a time when China opens up to other societies. This tolerance of ideas, religions and cultures has thus become the biggest legacy of this ancient route. Welcome to Dialogue, Madam. Hello. Helga, you have been promoting the idea of uh, constructing the so-called Euro-Asian land bridge, which is very similar to the uh, brainchild of Mr. Xi Jinping, the Silk Route that uh, goes through the cent Central Asia region. Now, you are sometimes referred to as the new Silk Road lady. Is that a title you are so proud of? Yes, I feel that is, uh, I, don't know, remem I don't remember exactly who came up with this idea, but I think it was because I uh, organized hundreds of conferences and seminars in the last 24 years for this So you conference. enjoy the copyright? Uh, well, yeah, <laughs> so to speak, yeah. But uh, in, in perhaps 1917, if my memory is correct, Dr. Sun Yat-sen, uh, President of the Republic of China, first put forward the idea of uh, building the Euro-Asian land bridge, hopefully to connect uh, uh, China with uh, Russia because he put forward the idea of uh, getting united with the Russians, the Red Soviets, the uh, Communist Party, workers and farmers. Uh, what do you think of his brainchild and have you got any inspirations from his proposal? Uh, yes, because uh, Dr. Sun Yat-sen was obviously very much concerned about the well-being of the population and he also saw in the uh, railway connection between all these different countries a way to preserve peace and that has been exactly what has been inspiring us to go with the Eurasian land bridge because it was meant from the beginning after the collapse of the Soviet Union as a peace order for the 21st century. So do you think the well-being of the people should be the vital problem of China in those days? That's the title of the book written by Dr. Shen Yasheng. Yes, he was very much inspired also by Lincoln and the idea of uh, government by the people, for the people, uh, of the people. And therefore, you know, I think that that is uh, what we have to think about today, too. But what's the relevance between Abraham Lincoln and the New Silk Road? Well, because it is a system of uh, <coughs> physical economy. Nowadays, you are very much in monetarist terms 
think people think about profit and that has led the world to this present terrible crisis of a uh, threatening collapse of the financial system and we have to go back to the idea of physical economy uh, which is associated with the industrial revolution of America which was the result of the policies of uh, Lincoln who also uh, created a land bridge uh, throughout America. So, you know, we have to go back to the ideas of, of a, a system of protectionism, of uh, taking the, a sol as the only source of wealth the creativity of the people uh, and not think about buying cheap, uh, selling expensive what is associated with free trade. So, if the whole world wants to get out, out of the present crisis, it has to be based on the ideas which already led to industrial revolutions in the past. All politics uh, are local. Therefore, trade protectionism, whatever the label you use to describe uh, uh, trade protectionism, is a product of domestic politics. Uh, um, let's uh, get back to examine the history of the ancient Silk Road. I wonder if you can brief us about how the Silk Road involves uh, much of Asia and parts of Europe. In the ancient times or now? Ancient times. <laughs> well, uh, 2,000 years ago, you know, the ancient Silk Road connected cultures and people, you know, and there were all kinds of modes of traveling horses, camels, ships, and it, that, it did create the basis for a tremendous increase of wealth of all the countries which participated in the Silk Road. So I think that if we basically revive this conception, it will be to the benefit of all participating countries. Mm -hmm. uh, Central Asia is the bridge linking developed European countries uh, with the Asia-Pacific economies. Uh, however, do you think uh, the economic belt that President Xi Jinping raised uh, when he was attending the uh, summit meeting for Shanghai Cooperation Organization in Kazakhstan would help the region of Central Asia to prosper and enjoy cool prosperity? Well, these countries suffer still from the monocultures of the Soviet Union. Uh, many countries have a lack of water. So when we are talking about the extension of the Eurasian land bridge or the new Silk Road, it's not just railways or means of transport, but it's a new economic platform which transforms the entire economy of the region into a much higher productivity. Uh, it also involves the question of uh, corridors, you know. Uh, we have developed the idea that the Silk Road should have probably 100 kilometer width. Uh, you put in new energy production and distribution, new communication, and this way you make areas which are landlocked and don't have access to the sea or rivers uh, as investment friendly uh, like uh, countries which are on the seaside or at, at river systems. So it, it basically means that the landlocked areas of all of Eurasia uh, will enjoy uh, the same benefits uh, like countries on, on maritime uh, coasts. And uh, you know, this will lead to a new era of uh, economics. It, the land bridge or Silk Road conception is not just you know, more cooperation among countries, but it is, if you think back, evolution of civilization happened first by cu uh, cultures and countries settling at the coasts, then you would move through the rivers, and... And even through the opium war and the slave trade, to begin with, for the success story, the early part of the economic success story for the European powers. Uh, but uh, I hope you can understand that there's a sense of... Uh, 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 victimhood by many Asians. Um, Central Asia used to be the backyard of the former Soviet Union. Therefore, do understand the geopolitical concerns of the Russians when it comes to the future of, uh, say, the new Silk Road or the economic belt that threaten to connect China through Central Asia with uh, uh, they develop the European parts? Well, I think we have to move away from geopolitics because geopolitics has given the world two world wars in the 20th century. And if we stay with geopolitics, I think we are on the verge of a third world war. 
and therefore I think the conception of the Eurasian land bridge which is in certain sense a little bit larger than only the Silk Road because it also involves the building uh, of a corridor along the Trans-Siberian uh, uh, Trans Railway and it has many uh, routes going all the way to Indonesia, into Africa. Uh, we are really talking about the Silk Road being the beginning of a world land bridge. And I'm very happy to tell you that my friends in Russia recently communicated to me that why they thought a couple of years ago that this conception would be too big, that now under the impression of both the dangers in Ukraine, but also the positive experience of Sochi, uh, and I don't mean the Olympic Games, but I mean the fact that uh, Russia has developed the Sochi region as a model for the transformation of other parts of Russia, uh, and that therefore they are very, very positive about the future perspective of cooperating with the Silk Road and the Chinese government. And also President Putin has expressed very clearly that, that he seeks such a cooperation. So therefore I think there is a very good prospect that this can succeed. However, a few days ago when I was interviewing the Russian ambassador, Mr. Andrei Denisov, he said the, what is called New Silk Road or Economic Belt remain largely a concept. It's not very operational. At the same time, our friends in Shanghai Corporation Organization, namely the Central Asian nations, enjoy very much the Chinese investment. So do you see the subtle distance in the attitudes of both the Central Asian governments and Russia? Well, I think what counts is the attitude of President Putin and you know some of the other people who I'm in contact with because you know I don't think that everybody is already has already moved away from such concerns as the ambassador expressed but I think the future is right now we are at an incredible dangerous moment of history and either we get our act together as a civilization which can consciously go into a new era of mankind or we may not exist. If we, don't, if we don't change the ways how things are going now, you know, we, we may end up in a third world war. So I think it is extremely important to put a peace order for the 21st century on the table and you know, create a, a, a level of reason where everybody participates, uh, who pa participates has a benefit. So that historical conflicts, past wars, and ethnic conflicts and all these problems are put behind us because if you build the Eurasian land bridge as a totality from all of Europe to Asia... We must adopt a holistic view about the prospects of the uh, Euro-Asian land bridge. So you sound very rational, reasonable and correct. Perhaps so far we are discussing the prospects of a Silk Route uh, only from the Russian and Chinese perspectives. Uh, in this process we, have, uh, we may have ignored the important role that the Persian state of Iran plays uh, because it's a very, Im a very important uh, a literal state of the Caspian Sea. It enjoys uh, um, the uh, oil deposit so what do you think of the current process of rapprochement between Western countries and the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran when it comes to energy collaboration uh, between China and the volatile Middle East region? Well, you know, we have uh, created actually a development terrible poverty by terrorism, by the effects of the drug trade. And if you want to have peace, right now this region is one of the many uh, potential powder kegs which could uh, run when it comes to energy collaboration uh, between China and the volatile Middle East region? Well, you know, we have uh, created actually a development program as part of the Eurasian land bridge which encompasses the entire region from Afghanistan, Pakistan, Afg uh, all the way to the Caucasus, to Syria, to the Gulf, to take this region as one area which right now is torn apart by to a third world war eruption. It's like the Balkans was before World War I. So the only way how you can stabilize this region, especially with the perspective of American and NATO troops uh, leaving Afghanistan, or at least a large part of them, uh, you need to put in a real development perspective. And we have de developed a program which involves 
uh, greening the desert because most of the region is, is desert. You can use the water of aquifers. Uh, you can redirect certain rivers uh, which right now flow into the Arctic in Siberia. You can redirect them, channel them to the Aral Lake. Uh, you can use that water to basically uh, develop all of Central Asia in terms of water, lead pipelines into Iran, and then have as a second phase uh, <coughs> the uh, peaceful nu uh, use of nuclear energy for large amounts of desalinization of ocean water and start to green the desert. If you want to put in infrastructure as densely uh, as it is, for example, in Western Europe. And if you think, you know, Germany, for example, which enjoys uh, infrastructure, which is rivers, uh, railways, highways, which are all interconnected, and infrastructure is always the precondition for economic development. Very much so. It is in this area the Chinese investment uh, is highly expected by all the markets in that particular region. But I have to leave you there for the moment. You are watching dialogue with uh, Helga Zapap Hush, uh, chairwoman of a think tank in Europe. She's also called the lady of the uh, ancient Silk Road. We'll get back to examine and to examine these and other issues. Stay with us. Now let's look at Afghanistan. It currently remains an observer partner of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Following the military drawdown of the US-led NATO troops by the end of this year, post-war reconstruction in this uh, landlocked, impoverished country would become a major concern for the rest of the world. That's part of the exit strategy and China would be an integral part of the uh, post-war reconstruction. To my poor knowledge about this country, it used to depend and perhaps it currently also depends on uh, drug cultivation and drug trafficking for much of its livelihoods. There's also a lot of uh, you know, tribal rivalry between different land, uh, uh, warlords and landlords and tribal rivalries of different kinds. What do you think of the difficulties lying ahead for major members of the SCO to get involved with the post-war reconstruction so that countries along the Silk Road really enjoy cool prosperity? Well, I mean, the truck production has increased 40 times since NATO uh, started the war in Afghanistan 12 years ago. Uh, <coughs> this has become the major security problem for Russia, which is losing right now 100,000 people per year and the Russian truck czar uh, Viktor Ivanov has called on the West and other countries to operate to deal with that. Now we know that uh, the uh, truck traffic from Afghanistan and the truck laundering of money uh, is the main source for the financing of terrorism, of Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra and, and similar uh, groupings, but many of the people who have been recruited to this did not so because they are radical jihadists, but because they are poor. And they, you know, if they are offered $500 a month, uh, then they join this, and therefore it, the key question will be first to eradicate, eradicate the drug production, which is very easy with modern technology, you can eradicate it. You can spot the, the roots of the money laundering because, you know, with modern technology, which now the uh, NSA has proven, they can, you can, from satellites, you can spot every plant if you want. Uh, so the question of both stopping the production and the laundering is technically no problem. Uh, and then, naturally, you have to put in an alternative a vast development program for the population so that they have an incentive uh, to go in a different direction. And I have said since a very long time that if the neighbor countries, Russia, China, uh, I Iran, India, Pakistan, would all cooperate in such a, a regional development conception, then you can get Afghanistan uh, in a peaceful direction. But only if you do it in a totality, you know, it does not function if you only take it as one country. There has to be a genuine development of the entire Eurasian land bridge and then you can contain and overcome this problem. What do you think of the idea of a maritime Silk Road? Well, that's a very good idea because, you see, in Southeast Asia, uh, there is the largest concentration of 
population in the world and the present strait of Malacca for example is completely overloaded uh, and therefore you need to develop new trade routes both in a maritime way, for example we have proposed as part of this Eurasian land bridge the building of the Kra Canal uh, which would be parallel to the Strait of Malacca uh, and you know open, open this region for more trade. If we go in the direction of the Eurasian land bridge the uh, production of real wealth will increase dramatically and therefore you need new trade routes uh, to you know, integrate all of these countries uh, together and you know we have written for example I think 20 years ago a plan for a 50 year development of the Pacific uh, region uh, which already uh, had all of these projects so many of these projects are ready to start tomorrow uh, and you know congratulations <laughs> congratulations on your blueprint and the vision for the uh, prosperity in the Asia Pacific region but so far I believe you try to look at these issues uh, from the European perspective which might be uh, acceptable by parties involved. However, what do you think of the Chinese uh, brutality of uh, taking over the Gadar deport port in Pakistan and help construct uh, a port in Myanmar so that the uh, pipeline could be built to connect the uh, oil shipments uh, from the seas uh, to Xinjiang in the case of Pakistan and through Myanmar to China one way or another. I mean this is the blueprint of Mr. Xi Jinping and his uh, predecessors. Well I know that some people may be concerned about Do you China. know the subcontext for the Chinese brain children? It's because, uh, because of the legacy of the Cold War most Chinese uh, don't quite trust the security umbrella that the US provides because uh, you know they are afraid of uh, China sharing the center stage. They are afraid of uh, China sharing the center stage in the 21st century. It's largely a challenge coming from a newcomer to the existing international political and economic order. The U.S. is not ready yet. The context for the Chinese brain children is because, uh, because of the legacy of the Cold War. Most Chinese uh, don't quite trust the security umbrella that the U.S. provides because, uh, you know, in the 21st century it's largely a challenge coming from a newcomer to the existing international political and economic order. The U.S. is not ready yet. Therefore, China has to consider its own alternative. Well, uh, but, you know, there are also people who say you should not be afraid of the economic prosperity of China. For example, the U.S. General Chief of Staff General Dempsey has made many speeches where he warned uh, the West of falling into the Thucydides trap. Mm -hmm. uh, Thucydides was this Greek historian who wrote about the Peloponnesian War and he said that this war occurred because the Athenians were afraid of the economic growth of Sparta and that led to this war and he said the growth of China should not lead to such a Thucydides trap. And you know, in a certain sense I don't think that that is the main problem. The main problem of the world right now is that the entire transatlantic region is collapsing. The US economy is collapsing. The European Union is suffering a terrible crisis in southern Europe. The financial system of the transatlantic region is about to blow out. What do you think of the importance of having the US support for both the, the land Silk Road and the man maritime Silk Road? Because uh, I hate to always uh, uh, go to great length in addressing geopolitical issues, but don't you think geoeconomic issues and geopolitical issues are quite interwoven? Well, I think we need to have a change in American policy for it to support the Silk Road, because right now uh, the United States is not in conformity with its own constitution in terms of its policy. Uh, there is a lot of criticism of President Obama even from the Congress because this is the case. So we need a change in American policy but there are fortunately many patriots in the country who are thinking exactly about such a change. So you know we are in a crisis, we are in an existential crisis of civilization right now and what we are proposing and what President Xi Jinping is proposing is a vision of the future and you know a lot of the geopolitical thinking is of the past and if we cannot 
move to the next phase, the next era of, of civilization, we may not exist. Right now we are on the verge of World War III. The developments in the Ukraine are extremely dangerous and uh, could really lo lead to a terrible confrontation. Do you take uh, the political upheavals in Ukraine as a part of their painful democratic transformation? Or do you think it is largely a geopolitical legacy between the Russians and the European Union in how to uh, uh, reallocating the political resources in that poor country? No, I think this is the result of a policy of regime change which started, which started when <coughs> the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, the first phase of this was the Orange Revolution where uh, the West had put up 2,200 NGOs which selected a network of people based on their anti-Russian profile. Uh, this was in 2004, but now it's much worse because what you have now is that uh, the hardcore violence is conducted by Nazis. Svoboda is a Nazi party. They have a swastika as their party logo. And it's completely scandalous that the U EU and the United States are supporting uh, such uh, violent networks. Well, uh, Ukraine could be part of a uh, uh, broad spectrum of the uh, Silk Route that goes through Central Asia connecting with uh, much of Europe. Whether Emerging markets or uh, neighboring markets uh, of the Silk Route will benefit from uh, President Xi Jinping's idea. It largely depends on whether the Chinese economy could be sustained, whether we would enjoy sustainable prosperity. So by the end of this uh, conversation, which I think is very enlightening, what do you think of the future of the Chinese economy? Um, and the new leadership of President Xi Jinping and President Li Keqiang. Well, I think they're doing an excellent job from my standpoint. Also, Prime Minister Xi, uh, Li went to Romania, met with 15 heads of state and promised that China will build a fast train system in Eastern and Central Europe. This is all very, very good. The problem is that the financial system of the transatlantic zone is collapsing. And we need a change in the monetary system uh, that's why we're proposing for the United States and Europe the return to the banking separation which was implemented by President Roosevelt in 1933. Thank you for your participation. I truly appreciate it. With that, we come to the end of the edition of Dialogue. I'll see you next time. Until then, goodbye.